bonjour. And uh, here we are going up the coast of Spain to the Mediterranean ports uh, that I'm sure you've perhaps been to a few of them before, but I'm going to be talking about Barcelona, then Marseille, uh, Palamos, and Saint-Tropez, and Monaco. Now this is a beautiful part of the world, a sort of sun-kissed uh, with a great deal of leisure and uh, culture. And uh, I've been sailing around the Mediterranean on and off for many years, and I'm always amazed at just when you think you know a place, then when you go again, particularly if you go farther into the land or deeper into the city, there's always a beautiful surprise awaiting us. So I'm just going to skip ahead. Here's a, a view of the statue overlooking Barcelona featuring the national dance of Catalonia, the Sardana. And uh, this is a region with uh, a variegated coast and the borderline between France and Spain actually is Cap Cruz, which is a very rocky and in ancient times a dangerous place to pass. So the, the shipping traffic we've been watching uh, coming out of Gibraltar are either heading up toward the north coast or on to Suez and now we are out in, in the broader Mediterranean. But Catalonia, that part of the, the Kingdom of Spain, has on and off been an independent country on its own and this is its emblem even though it has the, uh, the royal crown under the King Juan right now. But it had been a uh, a uh, harbor for millennia, going back to the Phoenicians, the Romans, and then the various uh, powers that came to uh, do trade and also reside in, in Barcelona. Now this is an old uh, ad admiralty map of the bay that was the original harborage for sail ships. And overlooking that is the uh, what they call Mount, uh, uh, Just, Mont Just, which is the fortified hill that is the center of the strategic value of Barcelona, going back into, uh, again, Roman times. Uh, but nowadays we will be docking at uh, that large cr uh, cruise terminal that's right below the mountain, and then um, you can take a conveyance or shuttle, I believe, right into the old port, which is right in the center of town. It's uh, much too small for a ship of this size, even though you can see here they have uh, ferries that run across the Mediterranean. Uh, out of Barcelona. It's a major transportation hub, both uh, sea, air, and land, of course, on the coast. Uh, this is the center of the town, which uh, has the harbor and then a grid pattern of the walking streets going up into the Gothic center and uh, the Gothic district and also up into the, uh, the broad and elegant main avenues of the city, then out into the sprawling uh, large industrial city that it is above. But here's just a scene in the harbor of one of the old um, Catalan fishing boats which they use for sail training in and out of the old harbor. And as you go up into the town you are met by this tremendous plaza which is the statue to Columbus. Um, now there are many of these around in Spain of course as one of the heroes of history uh, but, but curiously he came and uh, they built this monument to him even though he's pointing to the east not the west but that's just because of the facing of the harbor. There are many beautiful plazas and monuments to various historical figures, and uh, it's a very elegant town, but the, the interest in when you get off the ship and or into the old harbor is to walk up the La, Las Ramblas, which is um, uh, formerly the medieval street that led into the walled city, and now it is this uh, pedestrian avenue with shops all along, and beautiful trees and unfortunately you have to watch out because that gets very crowded and it's famous for its pickpockets. So keep your uh, articles uh, that uh, you, you need uh, safe on, in your front, just a tip of it. But the uh, Ramblas is a, a slow hill that goes up to one of the main uh, plazas of Catalonia up higher in the city and off of that are the, the uh, medieval quarter and then some of the beautiful elegant uh, buildings from 18th and 19th century. Now Barcelona is right at the crux of when in medieval times the uh, Moors had taken most of the Iberian Peninsula but uh, the Catalans who have their own language that's sort of somewhat between Castilian and French have always had their own leadership and they fought back against the the Moors and up in the upper part of Catalonia there was the great battle with Roland who uh, stopped the, uh, the advance of the, of the Moorish armies that might have gone farther into Catalonia and even into France. So this is 
uh, King, King uh, uh, Joao of Aragon in 1229. And he sent his cavalry and navy out to also take the Balearic Islands of uh, Mallorca and Minorca, which are now still part of Catalan. Well, then when Spain, Spain was unified by uh, Isabel and Ferdinand, joining Leon and Castilla, they also absorbed Catalonia and uh, Andalusia and the other parts of Spain to make the nation that we know it now. And of course, it was they that sent Columbus out to explore. And they also drove the Jews out of um, Spain and set up the, say, the modern history of Spain and much of the rest of the world. Now, but Catalonia was always a independently minded part of Spain and it had battles on and off again in the various wars of Spanish disillusion, the, 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 the Carlist War, uh, the War of the Spanish Succession, and uh, the forces from Madrid actually came and had laid siege on the town in 1709. And that's been a tradition that's very deep in the Catalonian people that they have always resisted the uh, forces from Madrid, even though in modern terms it's not that far away, but there have been rebellions in Catalonia uh, on and off for years, and most famously during the Spanish Civil War, the uh, Falangists, which were the uh, Catalonian guerrillas against the forces of Marco, uh, uh, Franco, sorry. And so this is a pretty fresh memory in Spain uh, because um, it was only 1976 that Franco died and then King Juan assumed the leadership uh, in the constitutional mar monarchy. But uh, you will see in Barcelona and other parts of uh, Catalonia, Palamos, when we go there, that there are always Catalonian flags and not the national flag of Spain as much except on an official building. And there was a referendum just last year where the overwhelming majority of Catalans uh, voted to be independent even though it had no, no legal status in Madrid. So this is a, a contemporary history of Spain which you can appreciate when you're there because uh, Catalonia is a very, uh, it's the, the largest and most prosperous city of Spain and thereby feels that it has status to be independent from the king and his family. You, if you read the paper, they've been having a few scandals uh, of embezzlement and the princess has been called the first time into a criminal court in Madrid to testify about her finances, which may be the demise of the royalty in Spain. Well, let me just go back to uh, Barcelona, though, because this is a particularly interesting town. Uh, this is the uh, Barigotic, which is the old medieval town. The, most of the walls have been taken down and it's surrounded by the modern city, but it has a lot of small walking lanes and shops and the cathedral and museums, and this is the real pleasure of visiting in Barcelona. You can go up the Ramblas, out into the different side streets, and just go back in time to Roman um, ruins and walls. Uh, there are medieval cathedrals and many uh, tight little corners which are uh, in the nighttime, that's particularly lively with people out in the uh, plazas and in the streets with a lot of small cafes and nightlife. Now, Barcelona has had a long history of visitors from around the world that came to enrich it. Also, the Catalan in, the, in Barcelona particularly was a major financier of the Spanish Empire, including Catalans and from Barcelona had the largest land holdings in Cuba. And so the wealth of the Spanish Empire came back partly to Barcelona and built these tremendous buildings that are, let's say, the uh, elegant period of the 1800s with a lot of fine artistry that was a pride of Barcelona to this day. So this is up the Ramblas. You can see these uh, period buildings and um, it's a, but it's a, a, a city that does not have, uh, let's say, hasn't been, uh, cut through by major highways. Those are all outside of town. So this is a beautiful walking town, even though it is a fairly large one. So there are more of these big plazas when you get up into the grid, particularly the Plaza Mayor, which is the, uh, the major palace. Like in most Spanish cities, you'll have a central courtyard where main events happen, um, whether they be for good or for bad protests or um, demonstrations in between the cafe life and the dancing and the uh, other activities. So this is right off of the Las Ramblas, uh, right outside of the medieval uh, section. But this is a meeting place uh, for a lot of people 
And this is the Sardana where every Sunday morning in front of the medieval cathedral they have a dance uh, for the public with a, drums and flutes and they all dance in large circles. And so it's a, a lively town. Another site right off the Ramblas is the uh, Mercat uh, San Jose or the uh, Bucaria, which is the major food market. And that is in a large iron uh, roofing and very vast market with a lot of fish and vegetables and things like this. But uh, it, it specializes also in these tapas outlets where you stand up, have a bit of a drink, and then you have a little taste of small foods like you are familiar with, I'm sure. The origin of tapas, though, is when uh, someone would get a drink, they would put a plate on top to uh, keep the dust out in a dirty market, let's say. But now it's become that plate is put food on it. So traditionally, people will sit and have drinks and snacks standing up in the market. I put up a few words of uh, Catalan here, which uh, as someone described, they, they are blind in love with uh, their own language. And so some words we use in other languages come from Catalan. First of all, uh, liberal, which means a progressive or a free thinker. And then the guerrilla, um, which were the local Catalans who fought a back um, action against the Napoleonic troops as they came down and swept through uh, Spain and Catal Catalonia in the early 1800s. And then Sani, which is meant to use sort of common sense, uh, Rauca, which is fantasy and um, madness, which some of their artists uh, personify. Rambla, which means to wander. Like we use that as a, a rambling along, let's say. And then Gaudi, gaudy in English and in uh, many languages that is a term for something that's a little over the top in its design or its uh, flamboyance, but that's actually a compliment in Catalonia and Barcelona. So here you have, for instance, one of the museums with fantastic construction and, wa and waterfalls. This is on uh, uh, Mount Juice, the mountain just to the west of the main city. And it has classical art of the region. And then there are a lot of modern museums that feature the local artists. Now, this one, of course, everybody knows, Pablo Picasso, who was born in Malaga, but he lived in Barcelona as a young man. Then he moved to Paris and made his career around the world. There's also the local artist uh, Jean Miro, who has two museums to his credit in Barcelona, one that's his old house and studio downtown, the other one which is a new building up on the mountain. The most famous of all of the Catalonian artists was by far Antonio uh, Gaudí, who was the great architect designer of numerous buildings which are featured on, if on you go in, on tour, you see them around the city, there are quite a few of them. Um, this is the uh, the Casa Gorel and the um, roof of, it has all these fantastic shapes. Now he, he never designed anything that had a f flat surface or pure horizontal or vertical. So this is where these buildings, which are apartments to this day, those that are not part of uh, the South sort of house museum, you can go in, you see people living in them. Some of them give you access just in the lobby or up onto the roof. And so this is quite fantastic architecture that has led to, let's say, say, the rebirth of sort of asymmetrical shapes in modern architecture. But uh, he uh, was a dedicated Barcelonan who was commissioned to build these fantastic luxury apartments back in the late 1800s. So if you do one thing in Barcelona, is to go up the Ramblas and go and see these houses that are up on the upper part of the Ramblas in, in the center of the city. But uh, he believed in organic forms, and so he took from plants and animal life uh, uh, this kind of visual sense, most of it uh, made into ceramics and then adorning these fantastic buildings, this Castello. And so at nighttime, these things look like they're some sort of a, a creature from uh, another planet. Um, so it's a distinctive thing of Barcelona. He did design a very large parcuel outside of uh, the downtown on, uh, near um, the uh, Sagrada Familia. But this is his great work that is yet to be finished. This is the Cathedral of the Holy Family. But it was not commissioned, or, or nor is it funded by the Catholic Church. It was all Gaudi's vision, and it's supported by local and international private donations to build it. Now, this was started in the 1890s, and then it has been slowly rising masonry and uh, 
reinforced concrete, but it's such a fantastic design that it, uh, it's again a, a sort of a fantasy of a, of a construction. Now, at this point, it is only about half finished, and now Gaudi himself lived on the site. He was unfortunately run over by a streetcar, and he's buried in the crypt, but his designs remain on, and they have sort of uh, challenged construction structural engineers ever since they were attempted to build this fantastic uh, construction. So it's still going on now. You can go and go around the site, see they're still building the outer towers now. And so this is a work in progress. They estimate it'd be at least another 50 years to finish it, like traditional cathedrals took many generations. But it is a, certainly a fantastic site. Meanwhile, the rest of Barcelona has grown as a major commercial city and has popped up what I call the big glass boxes all over. And so while the cathedral of Sagrada Familia is still being worked on very slowly by dedicated artists, and especially stone carvers, uh, these other parts of Barcelona feature the best and the worst of modern architecture. Uh, here's actually an apartment house, sort of like the Gherkin in London. And it lights up at night in sort of the center of the neighborhood that is on the east side of the downtown. In 1992, the Barcelona hosted the Summer Olympics, and so they had a whole other area that was built as an Olympic park with, again, some fantastic uh, modern structural engineering, stadiums, and then this tower of designed by uh, Calatrava, the Spanish architect who's a famous engineer and almost a sculptor of modern iconographic architecture. At the same time, they built out a whole new beach area in Barcelona. So right downtown, they call it the New Harbor, there are beaches. And then this has led uh, to further development out on the water. It used to be industrial shipping and, and factories in a lot of these areas. They've made uh, it into a sort of resort right in the city, including this uh, Port Forum where I took my ship in with one of the world's largest solar panel. Um, it also has the world's largest uh, nude beach there. And uh, raves and youth come all from all over Europe and the world and have endless parties. They tried to keep them out of town because it was so uh, uh, raucous, good Catalan word. There are other uh, areas that are all, let's say, uh, um, very well-defined modern architecture, particularly very uh, angular. This is, again, near Port Forum. This is the Musée Blau, which is actually a science museum. But again, the Catalans are not, uh, let's say, shy about building fantastic structures. This one in particular has open roofs and reflecting pools all through it. We I don't know we have time to see all of this, but I'll just give you a taste of it. Now, if you do go on one of the adventures or tours, uh, this is particularly interesting is to go out of the center of the city uh, to Montserrat, which is a very unique mountain that is maybe 60 kilometers from the center of Barcelona, but it is a nature preserve and a, uh, a remnant of a, of a seabed that was picked up, has all these fantastic shakes, and you can actually hike around the whole mount of it. But um, the, the artists of Barcelona, the Catalan, said this was part of the inspiration for Gaudi and uh, others to make this sort of fantasy uh, sculptures of the, the, that they are known for. And, um, but up on that mountain is the famous monastery of Montserrat, which dates from the 9th century and was the repository library for the ancient texts of Catalonia. And, and when General Franco banned the publication of Catalan in trying to control the people of this region, uh, this became a readout and it was attacked a number of times, but the library was saved and is considered the fountain of the Catalonian culture. Now, up the coast, you get to the coast of Brava. Now, this is going up to Palamos, where there's a, a, a very rough coast and a couple of uh, old towns, uh, like this uh, tower on a bay. But the, the, the coast is so rough that it's very hard to get to a lot of these places. But as you go up toward um, the French border, we'll go to Palamos. But uh, particularly interesting is this is the home of Salvador Dali who also lived in Barcelona and Paris and around the world a bit, but he was the self-proclaimed uh, king of surrealism. And uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of his work. He has a number of museums around. His home was in Port Ligat, where he moved into an old fishing village and built him his own little uh, personal museum and lived out his days with his wife, Gala. That's a very charming place. I, ha I went up there a couple of years ago to visit. 
And uh, the town itself is very traditional, but uh, Dali's influence is uh, uh, pervasive. He had been born in the town of Figueros near Las Rosas. And uh, in, in his international fame, the town gave him the opera house that had been bombed out during the Spanish Civil War. And so this building that had, was a ruin right in the center of town, they just didn't know what to do with it. They didn't want to tear the rest of it down. So Dali himself designed his own museum with his iconic eggs on the roof and golden maidens and an interior that had uh, been destroyed, but it still had its opera balconies and then a big hole where the roof had been. And what he did is he put a glass top on it and made a grand atrium for his various large works. Of course, he was very prolific, and so the place is full of surprises, even if you think you know his work. I believe there is also a tour that goes there. It's well worth it if you, uh, if you like to surrealism. Well, then we'll be going to Palamos, which is a small and sort of classic Catalan harbor uh, with you know, uh, the remnant of a fishing fleet and uh, a lot of private yachts. And it's also uh, down the road from uh, Giron, which is another beautiful classic city in this area. But Palamos is completely quiet and uh, peaceful compared to uh, Rocas, Barcelona. And it's a small town, but a particularly a sweet place with a lot of beaches and coves. Now we're going to be seeing a lot like this as we go up to the Riviera, but uh, this area also has some of the early uh, Phoenician and then Greek and Roman ruins. And uh, here's some of the ruins, but here's a great aqueduct which comes down near Palamos. And here we uh, get to a place where the food is uh, its sort of Catalonian and French and as we go along the coast we will have uh, all these cafes that are there with fish dishes and ratatouille and different soups. Now, I don't mean to get you hungry. I know you haven't eaten in minutes, but uh, the, the combination in this area of the, let's say the Southern French style and the Northern Spanish style has a lot of different uh, dishes that are very good. A soup de pisto, which is sort of like a minestrone, vegetable soup. And then you also get the, um, the olive breads. And of course, you're getting into the area where olives are a major product. So here's a tempanade. And, uh, but it's very light and mildly spiced, but uh, very delicious. This is the chief food of uh, the, the, uh, the shore, the bouillabaisse, the seafood soup that is pervasive through this whole area. And then all the tarts and wine and everything you possibly want. Is it lunch yet? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to go on. Uh, we can make you a little hungry for more. This is near Cap Cruz, which is where the... Pyrenees come descending into the sea, and this was impassable by land except in a few strategic passes. But from there you get into the Bay of uh, Montpellier and then near Marseille. So I'll move in now into France. This is a, a very large city with um, just a million people in the area, but a lot of uh, shipping and uh, trans, uh, uh, industry in the area. This is the major city of southern France. Uh, it also dates from prehistory. Phoenicians first were there. It was a Greek trading port and Roman city. And then it came on to be this large city of uh, southern France. But they're continuing to keep find more evidence. Every time they break the ground for a new building, they're finding more coins or columns or catacombs even in the downtown. Even though the city was uh, badly bombed during World War II. Um, but it is revived in a very active place right now. This is the city seal. Here's a view of it in uh, earlier times when it was a very um, packed city with a lot of commerce in Africa. And to this day, you'll see in Marseille, there's a lot of uh, immigrants in there. And uh, it's a cosmopolitan city, but not that large as, a, as Paris, let's say. This is a, a view in the 1700s when it had the troubles of diseases and sanitation, typical of all these port cities. As we come into the port, though, you'll see this, uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Chateau d'If, which was where the Count of Monte Cristo was imprisoned. And this is, you've seen those dramas done, it. they're often shot on this very dramatic island right outside of Marseille. It is still, other than the museum part, a French Navy base. And then as you come into town, you get more houses along the points. And then the city, the Great Bay itself, and then as we come into the old town, now our ship can't do this. There's a very narrow gap with the fortress of uh, Saint-Jean overlooking the old port. 
And so this is where from the very earliest uh, centuries of the city, this is the heart of the city with fortifications. Now the current shipping is out on larger docks outside, of course. But uh, you can see above it the cathedral of uh, de la Gare, it's called it, uh, that reigns over the city. Now this is not an ancient cathedral, but it was put up as a, almost like a beacon for ships to see where the harbor really is. And up on top is a beautiful gilded uh, Madonna and child. Now here's just the plan of the downtown. So uh, we'll be docking off the map and then it's a short shuttle into the town and it's and again it's very compact around the harbor and you can walk around, walk about and see some of the ancient sites. So a lot of the buildings are uh, modern after the harbor had been bombed in World War II. But there are a few uh, classical buildings like this is the uh, the first hospice in the world which was a charity hospice and then there are elegant um, palaces, and this is a Salon de Musique, which performs uh, chamber music in it to the public. But most famously, the Marseillaise, the French national anthem, was written here. And a curious bit of musicology is that it was written by a royalist uh, officer to praise the, the king at the time. But in the French Revolution, the tune was so catchy that the revolutionaries wrote, rewrote the lyrics and we're singing it as they chase this, uh, that royalist uh, officer into Switzerland once upon a time. But Marseille also became the great access to the Mediterranean and the rest of North Africa and the world. So here's a poster about uh, some of the expositions they've had there. They had shipping companies that would go all around the world out of Marseille. And here's a view of the harbor and the area by Paul Cézanne. Nowadays, they've had a lot of... Um, interest in reviving some of the cultural life of Marseille. And this is the new Musée de la Méditerranée, which has just recently opened. And um, this is one of the sponsoring organizations of uh, the small research vessel that I, I've been captaining. And um, so we were actually uh, uh, docked right there at the new museum until we went to uh, the shipyard in Spain. But um, now I'm going to go on to Saint-Tropez, which is a famous resort up further up the coast east of Marseille. Now, the, this is where the Riviera has many uh, rocky uh, peninsulas and small bays, and so it's a very variegated coast. And town after town has its special attractions. Some of them are... Uh, more crowded than others, like Nice's, uh, because of the direct uh, high-speed train to Paris is full of people, and this time of year we will see plenty of other uh, visitors there. Uh, but this is the pleasure coast of southern um, France. And Saint-Tropez has a, the inland of uh, Provence, and then uh, all these small harbors and small bays that are often very exclusive and particularly very expensive. Saint-Tropez itself was always sort of the, uh, the playground of the elite and the wealthy of France and the rest of Europe. So it, there is a Saint-Tropez, he's, he's a Catholic saint, and so he is still venerated in the local cathedral. Here he is going to the beach. And again, it was a walled town that had defenses against, particularly piracy, because this part of the Mediterranean had for hundreds of, if not thousands of years, Corsairs and other uh, brigands coming from the sea, and the, typically the, the North Africans would come up and uh, storm a town and enslave the local men to be uh, galley rowers, and then the uh, Christians would return the favor by picking up slaves from Africa. So you can see in, in Saint-Tropez some of this heritage, even though that's not why what's going on now. Now everybody's just a slave to fashion. But uh, here's Saint-Tropez, the little harbor, very charming, again, uh, not very built up, like let's say the Spanish Costa of the Sol. Here is a famous Impressionist painting by uh, Paul Signat of the harbor of Saint-Tropez. And we'll, be, we'll go in there, um, I believe, by tender, and then land and see this uh, classic Riviera town with its cafes and uh, current artists that are on display. But Saint-Tropez became most famous because of Brigitte Bardot and Roger Vadim made the film and God made women, the famous 1955, let's say, uh, luscious film about the life along 
Saint-Tropez and the whole Riviera, and this caused it to be so famous. There is currently an exhibit of, of Bridget Bardot in her honor uh, at the Hotel de Ville in Saint-Tropez, and I was just looking on some more of the, the news. Um, they've had a problem of too many people coming, and there's a large beach called Pampelon, which is outside of the town, which is a public beach, and it's a four kilometer wide beach. It gets 30,000 visitors a day, and now the town has tried to manage the traffic. They decided to eliminate all the local street parking and have a parking lot upland and have a shuttle bus down to the beach. And then they wanted to protect the, um, the beach by rebuilding a sand dune. And this led to a, a strike by the, what they call the, uh, the beach uh, cabanas, which are restaurants built out on the sand. And uh, they're sort of famous in the fashion industry because that's where a lot of supermodels go to get, have uh, photo shoots. Uh, and it was described by one writer as uh, Fellini cast party on Dexedrine and Viagra. And you can rent a sunbed out off this particular beach uh, for 40, no, it's uh, 40 euros an hour, but you have to buy a bottle of champagne that goes with it. And famously, a particularly wealthy visitor came and brought a bathtub and had 50 bottles of champagne to take a refreshing champagne bath after bathing in the ocean. And uh, so this is completely overpriced, thanks to Bridget Bardot and her friends. The other scandal was the great uh, uh, British uh, owner, Harrods, uh, Mohammed al Fayed. He refused to get buy a mega yacht. He bought a classic sailboat, thereby angering the mega yacht industry down there. Because if the billionaires don't want to go sailing, they're sort of out of business. But you can see this uh, infestation of mega yachts all through this whole area. And then there's luxury hotels and such. Another little news item, which I hope we never come across, is there are burglars that come to hotels and particularly great mansions, and they know who's in them somehow, but they, believe it or not, they have uh, medical anesthetic gas. They spray it in the air conditioning, and then they break in while everybody's asleep and steal them blind, and then they wake up the next morning and everything's gone. So this is, a, uh, let's say, a plague of affluenza. They have such crafty thieves in France, but you know, then we're going to get to Italy where they're not as delicate, perhaps. Um, the other problem is the beaches have become um, often swamped with toxic algae, and this is a fate of the oceanography of the Mediterranean, is that uh, there have been invasive algae, uh, a f overfished shore, a upside-down ecology. So the, there's a one algae called the vampire algae, which takes over all the grassland. It's the world's largest single-cell and a plant, it's up to you know, a, a foot long and grows and displaces all of the other uh, grass and, and that upsets the spawning of fish. And I have a friend that we worked with who from the University of Marseille, a marine biologist, who said that the French coast of the Mediterranean, over half of it has been developed and the rest of it has been afflicted by invasive species. So this is an example of the crisis in the ocean, particularly the Mediterranean Sea. So most of the fish you get in the Restaurants come from the Atlantic coast or Africa now. There's hardly any large-scale fishing left in the Mediterranean. But meanwhile, it's a great pleasure to be on the beach. Now, this is an old postcard of 100 years ago when it became so popular and the trains took people down there. Now they all fly in, so it's more crowded than ever. And it has a bit of, uh, you know, hedonism is sort of one of the religions there. Uh, again, in... Uh, somewhere in the Côte d'Azur, I think it was in Saint-Tropez, there was a fashion model shoot where uh, semi-clad uh, models were posing in the local cemetery, and that literally woke up the dead, and the town protested. Now, this has been going on a long time, and so, you know, the French Riviera has uh, had an anniversary for the invention of the bikini. Now, I, I'm going to spare you a lot of pictures of bikinis, because you can see them for your own anthropological research, but this is nothing new. Here is a Roman mosaic from near Marseille back when they really knew how to party. But now it's really crowded. Some of these places, like I mentioned, have such a flood of people that it's, uh, I'd say it's the high price uh, Coney Island, but the food's better. And uh, if you want to get away from the crowds, you can go to Etz. There's a, I saw one of the tours goes up to this fortified 
very small village that's hanging on the top of the mountain. Again, they built it up there to stay away from the pirates back in the old days. Now it's, I guess, uh, modern pirates in places like this sell t-shirts. But uh, then we're going to go on to Monaco, which is again down the east coast, down near the Italian border between Monton and uh, Nice. And um, this is a, another, let's say, uh, jewel of the Riviera, but of course it's its own principality. And this is an interesting story that it has maintained its independence from France since the 13th century by the crafty leadership that it's always had in its position between Italy and France. But it is the densest populated independent nation in all Europe and also the wealthiest because of its uh, t uh, banking, casino, tax system. And so the uh, Monganes, they call them, are quite wealthy. And now I just read again in the paper that they were building a new public housing, which was starting at a million euros each. But only for the local people that, that they're trying to provide uh, cheap housing versus all of the other, well, let's say, wealth that pours into Monaco. You can see the harbor is full of fantastic yachts. Again, we'll be out and I believe tender in. And then the town is built up onto the cliffs with uh, these ring roads. It's pretty steep, but uh, you can get a taxi and stop up in the upper town, walk all the way back down. So it's very dramatic as a, as a piece of, uh, of a harbor, very uh, well uh, con uh, built out over the water with whole new areas and uh, it's uh, sort of the most compact of uh, urban areas in this whole stretch of the French and Italian coast. It has these classical buildings from the late uh, 1900s, the Hotel de Paris, which is a hotel, and then of course the Great Grand Casino, which is uh, famous around the world as one of the leading casinos of the world, and that's why Monaco actually could afford to be independent because the wealth that Monaco generated um, meant a lot of French came there and they wanted to be able to gamble where they couldn't in their hometown. Now this is the palace above the town that the Grimaldi, Grimaldi family has been there again since the 1300s, and this is Renier de Grimaldi uh, who had diplomatic relations with Italian uh, ducal states and then the other parts of France. Now at that time there were no unified nations, so he was one of many princes, but they have remained from medieval times to have their family seal and their royal status in the uh, royalty of Europe, but as an independent uh, small principality. They, they, they never claimed any more territory. And now their biggest business, other than the casino and the land ownership in Monaco, is they have one of the major um, shipping companies in the Mediterranean, particularly the passenger ferries that run between Italy, France, and even the north coast of Africa and Spain. Well, the modern area started with Charles III, who set up the casino. And so his family has, let's say, been prosperous ever since. Here's Elena, and uh, there's a long line of it. And the, and the, the uh, treaty with France in particular says if, if there's ever a break in the family succession, be either man or woman, Monaco will revert to the Republic of France. But you cannot have ruling royalty in France anymore, of course. <coughs> well, this is the most famous of the recent princes, uh, Rainier II. And uh, he was uh, even more famous because he met and wooed Grace Kelly, the the uh, film star. And this is the storybook uh, uh, wedding of the 1950s and they had a long life together uh, and she was still a famous fashion leader and a very graceful princess even though I believe she was from Iowa like, like my mother. But my mother didn't marry so well I guess. But unfortunately she on the streets of Monaco had an auto accident and died in the early 80s, and then he also passed away. This is their tomb in the cathedral. Now they have Princess Caroline, uh, who is the son, uh, I mean, the daughter of the current uh, Prince Albert. So she is now the designated to be the princess if he passes. So the family goes on and Monaco goes on. But of course it's sort of, um, I'd say, uh, over enriched. And I saw in the paper that this diamond is for sale, and it's only 130 carats. The Queen, Queen Diamond, but I believe it's on sale only until tomorrow. So if you get to call your bid in now. And the other thing that's famous in Monaco is the great F1, the the uh, 
auto racing, which is unbelievable because you get the, these packed streets and the, the town is packed with the visitors and these cars are going roaring all over that. That's a great event. The other thing they sponsor is a lot of sale uh, events. So off of Monaco, you always see scenes like this amidst the other mega yachts. And I'm just going to finish here, show you my little mega yacht, which is the research vessel Heraclitus, which I've been working on on and off for a number of years, which is a uh, essentially a marine laboratory with scuba set and a shallow draft vessel originally sponsored uh, with the filmmaker James Cameron for oceanographic research. It is curiously a, a, a Chinese rig for stability in the seas. And we've been sailing around the Mediterranean. It was actually the current project is not biology because that's so well studied, but it's uh, sociology in that um, some universities in Spain and France and the, the New Museum in Marseille sponsored the ship to go to the most remote islands and harbors of the Mediterranean to interview as an oral history the elders of the small villages where we go. So for, we've been going around to m mostly islands, uh, Sardinia, Corsica, Balearics, and going in, anchoring and going shore and uh, asking to talk to the, the last of the fishermen, the boat builders, the veterans, whoever they're. And invariably we'd find a, an elder who had their family moved away and they'd say, well, n nobody ever asked me my life story. And so this has created thousands of hours of human experience documented for preservation in the muse museum in Marseille. And of course, for us, uh, it was uh, not exactly the fastest sailing or cruise, but we got to go to places which we never saw before. These are islands off the Catalonian coast, which are volcanic remnants. And uh, again, it looks like a Gaudi uh, construction or some fantastic uh, um, imagination of uh, floating in the sea. Uh, this one had had a uh, naval base on it. It has an automated lighthouse on it now to uh, keep larger ships like this uh, well away. But there's always more to see and appreciate in this part of the world. And I'll leave you with uh, my last uh, quotations, which are a Latin phrase of Pontius Maximus, uh, to navigate is necessary. But life is not. In other words, the ship goes on even if the sailors don't. And here's another classic phrase in Latin. Salem non animon butat qui transit mare current. We can all say that together, which means those who run across the sea cannot change their spirit. In other words, you should enjoy your slow cruising, not try to get anywhere too fast. And that's the pleasure of the sea. And lastly, with Homer, the land divides, but the sea connects. And with that, I wish you a great trip along this coast and the Mediterranean. Bon voyage.